Hi, it's Heather from Thicketworks, and today I want to show you just how easy it is to create these beautiful pieces of Baroque jewelry. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to share with you information regarding a course that I've created called Mixed Media for Beginners. You can get a closer look at the project itself and some of the techniques that you'll be learning by clicking on the link in the description. We have students from all over the world who've participated in this fun course. This course is designed to build your creative confidence while arming you with a whole host of techniques and do-it-yourself art supply recipes that will serve you for years to come. All right, now on with the tutorial. This project begins with the Renaissance One Iron Orchid Designs Decor Mold. It's a super high quality, flexible silicone mold, and it includes so many designs. I'll be using the three that you see me pointing to here. I'll be using Kato Polyclay for this demonstration, and a variety of jewelry findings, including this really handy collection of antique bronze jump rings, a tissue blade, mica powder in a gold tone. I'll be using Pearl X in Sunset Gold, a soft bristled brush for applying the mica powder, and two tones of acrylic craft paint, antique teal and mint julep green. To condition the polymer clay, I'll be using a mini prep food processor and a pasta machine. I like to work on ceramic tiles when working with polymer clay. Polymer clay is incredible stuff, but in order to work with it successfully, we must condition it. The easiest way that I've found to do this is to chop it up into small chunks and then feed those chunks into a mini prep food processor. This will break them down into tiny little granules of polymer clay, which can then be easily blended together and then run through a pasta machine in order to make certain that the clay is thoroughly blended and easy to work with. Once the clay has been chopped into tiny pieces, you can gather small amounts of it at a time, work it through your fingers, and then run it through the largest setting on the pasta machine. I'll continue doing this until I have several sheets of conditioned polymer clay to work with. Now that the clay has been thoroughly conditioned, it's time to begin packing it into the mold cavities. I like to tear the strips into small pieces and then use finger pressure to push those pieces into the mold. Once I've compressed the clay as much as I'm able to with finger pressure, I reach for some kind of tool. The tool can be anything with a hard surface that you can use to apply pressure. The goal here is to ensure that we achieve two different ends. Number one, we want to make sure that the polymer clay is forced into all of the tiny nooks and crannies. And number two, we need to eliminate any possible air bubbles trapped between the layers of the clay. Once the clay has been compressed as much as possible, use a tissue blade to slice away the excess from the top of the mold. It's totally possible to bake the polymer clay within the confines of these high quality molds, but I'll need to be making multiples of one of the designs. So I thought I'd share with you the easiest way that I've discovered to remove freshly cast polymer clay from a silicone mold. After cracking the edges of the design, I place the mold face down on the ceramic tile and then press firmly against the surface so that the polymer clay has a chance to bond to the surface of the tile. Then I gently peel back the silicone mold, taking care to not distort the designs. Now it's time to cast a duplicate of this small design so that we'll have two pieces for our pair of earrings. Once I've sliced the back off of the polymer clay, in this instance, after I crack that mold, the clay peels out very easily without causing any distortion. Next, it's time to add a layer of rich metallic to the surface and I'm reaching for that Pearl X in Sunset Gold and a very soft bristled brush to help me apply the mica powder directly to the surface of the uncured polymer clay. 
there are enough polymers in the clay itself at this point to bond with the mica powder so that once these pieces are baked, the mica powder will have fused into the upper surface of the polymer clay, creating a permanent metallic gleam. I love watching the details emerge as I use a very light touch to gently brush that metallic powder over the upper surfaces of these beautifully detailed castings. Now it's time to bake these pieces according to the manufacturer's instructions. Once the pieces have been baked and have been allowed to cool down to room temperature, it's time to turn our attention to constructing the parts of these pieces that will allow them to be connected to jewelry findings. To create a solid bond with the jump rings that I've chosen, I'll be embedding those jump rings onto the back of each piece. This is a two-step process, and the first step is to apply regular cheap super glue, and then to attach the jump ring, making certain to embed the opening of the jump ring behind the polymer clay piece itself. I repeat this process on each of the pieces, adding multiple jump rings to this little double cherub design. A jump ring is applied at each of the upper corners and also at the base of this design to allow the main pendant to hang from it. Once the super glue has cured, it's time to apply a thin layer of polymer clay directly over the top of the jump ring. For this, I'm using liquid poly clay, which I've dispensed into an empty nail polish bottle. This makes it easy to keep the poly clay close at hand and to apply it to small finicky surfaces. I press the cured piece against the raw clay making sure to apply firm pressure. I repeat this for each of the pieces, rolling out a new piece of clay to provide a backing for each of them. Now that the cured castings have been firmly pressed into the raw clay, it's time to trim away the excess. For this, I'm using a scalpel. You could use any sharp craft blade that you have. Peel away the excess clay and set it aside for use in your next polymer clay project. I chip away at removing the excess clay, taking small snippets until almost none is left exposed around the silhouette of each piece. At that point, I like to lift the piece off of the surface and then begin manipulating the edges of the clay with finger pressure. I begin by gently folding over that edge and then scraping it away so that we have an almost seamless attachment between the raw clay and the cured casting. Because the jump rings are fully enclosed now between two layers of polymer clay, they will be sturdy for the life of the piece. Once you've completed this process, use your fingertips to smooth out the upper surface of the backing clay to the best of your ability, and then apply a release agent, such as Armor All, to the surface of the polymer clay. This will allow you to reach for your favorite rubber stamp and make an impression into the back of the clay so that you'll have a finished appearance on the back of each piece as well. Here, I'm giving you a close-up view of using just my fingertips to smooth the backing clay against the finished casting and only reaching for the scalpel to help remove the clay that filled the center of the jump ring. Again, I'm adding an impressed design using this beautiful script 
rubber stamp. Now it's time to apply another layer of mica powder, this time on the back of each of the pieces. Don't forget to add just a touch on the sides as well. To get rid of that pillowy appearance, I'm now taking a normal gift card and simply pressing down lightly on top of the back of each piece. That creates a more sophisticated appearance and gets rid of that odd puffiness that emerges when you use a rubber stamp. Once the pieces have been cured again in the oven, we're now ready to apply a beautiful but very simple faux verdigris technique. For this, I use a small amount of water and a single drop of paint. I like to use a mop style brush in order to dispense this wash over the top of each piece, making sure that the mixture slides into all the cracks and crevices. It's important to have a very watery blend at this point. You don't want to be brushing on full strength craft paint. I add a layer of this dark teal green to the front of each of the pieces and then take a soft absorbent cloth and blot, removing perhaps 80% of what I've just added. This will make sure that the beautiful metallic tones of the mica powder are not completely obscured by the wash of craft paint. Once the surface of the upper portion of each piece is dry, I flip them over and apply the same treatment to the back. After blotting away the excess paint, a heat tool is used to help cure these surfaces. And once they're dry, it's time for the next phase of this simple faux verdigris technique. Again, I'll be creating a very loose and watery wash of paint, but this time with the mint julep green. I begin with a bit of water and a single drop of paint, and we'll be applying it with a large, soft bristled brush so that it flows freely into all the crevices of the design. It's important to use a lighter hand as you apply what amounts to a highlighting color. You don't want to cover the entire piece with it. Be judicious and sparing in your application of the lighter color. If the wash appears to not be traveling as loosely as you'd like, if it doesn't flow into all of the nooks and crannies, you can encourage it to do so by adding a spritz of water on top and then coming back in with your soft absorbent cloth and dabbing away the excess. This will leave a very subtle verdigris effect. Adding the two different shades of green brings a lot of life to the final finish. I just love how authentic that looks. The combination of the muted metallic created by the mica powder finish and the incredibly simple washes of two different shades of green craft paint result in a patina that feels rich and aged and mellow. Once the washes have thoroughly dried, I like to place a good quality clear coat over the top of both the front and the back of each of these pieces. I spray from a couple of different angles because it's difficult to make sure otherwise that you're getting into all the nooks and crannies. And frankly, I want to enjoy wearing these pieces for years to come. After the application of the clear spray finish and a few jewelry findings, you'll have created this beautiful pair of dangle earrings 
and a gorgeous pendant to go along with them. The finished pieces are light as a feather, but very, very sturdy. They have a tactile appeal that today's modern jewelry designs just don't offer. I find it a pleasure to wear this antique style of jewelry, and I hope that you've enjoyed this as much as I've enjoyed creating it and sharing it with you. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Until next time, bye.